morning. Welcome each and every one of you, especially our colleagues who traveled from very far away. Um, we've, uh, we have attendees here from 44 different states and territories, everywhere from Palau to Puerto Rico, Guam, and uh, a special welcome to Morg, who's come all the way from Scotland. <laughs> And uh, more will be talking about special ed mediation in, in Scotland on Thursday. Um, and I'm fairly certain that the last time Cadre convened a national symposium four years ago, I didn't have nearly as much gray as I have now. And the only question is how much of this gray did I acquire over the last few weeks? Um, for those of you who were here four years ago, you may recall, and who was here four years ago? Raise your hand. Lots, lots of folks, right? You, you may recall that this um, hotel, the Valley River Inn, was sold in the middle of our symposium. You remember that? And there, were, there was a bit of trepidation, but it all went pretty smoothly. Well, the hotel was sold again. Although this time, they managed to complete the transaction just about a month ago. Uh, they'd obviously caught wind that we were coming. <laughs> uh, but what I really want to know is what you all did to your guest rooms four years ago. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> um, I really want to thank our sponsors, uh, whose generosity has really helped elevate the overall quality of this, of this event, and including actually being able to feed people, which is usually a good thing. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Doug and Joyce Little, and the whole team of folks from Key to Ed, uh, Lenore Knudsen and Stephanie Weaver from Pangora Consulting, Joanne Blades at the Special Education Resolution Center at Oklahoma State University, Patricia McGinnis and her colleagues at Turning Point Training, David Gruber and his team of folks at, at the S Michigan Special Ed Mediation Program, the Dispute Resolution Education Resources, Greg Abel at Sound Options Group, and Jim Lomit and all the folks at Resourceful Internet Solutions, Mediate.com, and their Caseload Manager program. Let's just give them a real <laughs> And Marshall, thank you for that fantastic introduction. And we'll, we'll have um, a few more things to say about you in the next couple days. And, and Tina, thanks for that um, excellent welcome from OSAP. And, and from, from you, and um, you, as she had indicated, she was not able to join us four years ago. She decided that getting married was a higher priority, which is understandable, and since that time, she's had a lovely, beautiful boy, and she's managed to complete a doctorate, so um, she's been quite busy, but you've never been too busy for us, and the important work that Cadre does. And uh, as Marshall had indicated, we are absolutely certain we have the best project officer at OSEP. Thank you. Cadre has a particular interest in productive conversations. Conversations occur everywhere and all the time, in hallways and offices, dinner tables and living rooms, IEP meetings and mediations, during workshops and conferences. Conversations occur at board meetings and state council for special education meetings and every two to four years at a Cadre National Symposium. Fifteen years ago, Cadre convened our first National Symposium on Dispute Resolution, thus bringing what to that point was perhaps an occasional chat. And that symposium brought it closer to a, a deeper conversation and eventually we think a national dialogue. Along the way, we evolved from talking about mediation to a more profound, a more meaningful dialogue about a wide continuum of options that prevent and resolve conflict, about using approaches that build trusting partnerships. And now, six symposia later, the sun is shining on the contours of incredible change in the landscape of dispute resolution and special education. At the risk of being self-congratulatory, well done, my colleagues. <laughs> You're doing the work, the hard work. And indeed, our work is not done. There is much left for us to do and learn. Fortunately, 
help has arrived. The heart of a powerful conversation is asking good questions and listening. We have with us today two experts at both. Miriam Novotny works at the Mosaic Learning Center in Vermont. At Mosaic, they are dedicated to providing purposeful experiences, educational opportunities, and therapeutic interventions for students with developmental disabilities. They seek to provide meaningful, positive change in the lives of students and their families. What else is Miriam involved with? Well, one example is she facilitates a leadership development special interest group where participants explore the topic of how hiring practices and onboarding procedures can influence and support a thriving workplace culture. And you can learn more about Miriam um, by reading her biographical information in the program. Prue Sullivan is the practitioner in residence at the David Cooperwriter Center for Appreciative Inquiry, having recently retired as the Director of Continuous Learning at Keurig Green Mountain. Do you, do you have Green Mountain coffee dispensers in your rooms? It, I'm sure if you've stayed in any number of hotels, you've come across them. The Cooper Rider Center is a center of excellence at Champlain College, offering custom consulting services, executive training and workshops, and academic certificate programs. Earlier in her career, Prue was the founding partner of The Change Factory, an, uh, an international consulting practice of the, uh, an international consulting practice focused on individual and organizational breakthrough and growth. And, before that, she worked in the nonprofit sector with Vista and the Salvation Army. Again, you can learn more about Prue in the program. Both are involved with the Vermont Association for Talent Development, which recently convened their first ever summit, Leveraging Our Talents, Designing Our Future. This voluntary association is dedicated to creating learning and networking, networking opportunities for professionals who are passionate about leading, managing, learning, training, coaching, and mentoring. So I'm not going to say any more about these two wonderful women because they are far more interesting to listen to than I. So please join me in welcoming Miriam and Prue. My husband yesterday, I brought the, the program, he goes, yeah, let me read about you. <laughs> so we're going to start with a practice that, uh, that I learned about last week that was done at the Appreciative Inquiry International Conference, which was in South Africa. We were lucky enough to have a colleague from South Africa. And she explained a way that they started each day in greeting each other. And so I've modified it a little bit. So at your table, even across tables, you're going to, uh, shake or hug based on your, you know, how well you know that person. And you're going to say, Carrie, Carrie, I love being on this journey to evolve our landscape with you. <laughs> All right, and then you're just going to do that around your table. You can cut across tables and yeah. Janine, I love being on this journey to evolve <laughs> our landscape with you. All right, go after it. Go on. Woo! All righty. How was that? I felt the temperature in the room start to rise. I know, she's trying to tip the presenter. I wasn't going to tell her about that. So what we're going to spend time on is, can go back one? Yeah, so one of the things in Appreciative Inquiry is that it takes a lot of time to hone your topic. Like, what is it we were going to talk about? So Mary and I have our heads together, and we're honing and honing. And it's really about creating a topic that represents what you want in the world. And so this is where we landed, harvesting a system strengths to ignite a student's positive core. Igniting a system strength, harvesting a system strength to ignite a student's positive core. Does that seem like it's worth spending some time on? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. And so to do that, um, we're going to spend time on personal reflection. We're going to have dialogue with each other during this keynote. 
and we're going to explore application. We're going to use those different avenues to lift up the work that you're doing, to look at the strengths and the possibilities for the future. I love this. A human systems grow and move in the direction of what we study most deeply, frequently, and authentically. As we study a system's strength or an individual's strength and lift those up, we get more of those. And so that's what we're going to collectively do here this morning and then throughout the, the rest of your week together. It's when things are working, what's the root cause of that? And understanding it at a deep level. Good morning, everyone. It's such a privilege to be here with you today. Um, Prue and I were really uh, delighted when we arrived at the airport and we met this wonderful group of people who are waiting on the van. Good morning. <laughs> Long days of travel, and I was listening to these wonderful kind of cascade of y'alls, and I was like, oh, Prue. I said, I came out west and found my southern folk, so thank you. <laughs> Lifting my southern spirit. So true to the spirit of appreciative inquiry, we're going to just simply dive in and learn by doing. So what I'd like you to do this morning is go ahead and open the brochures that are ahead in front of you. Take those out. Thank you. And we're going to uh, go into what we call the first D of appreciative inquiry and do some discovery interviews about flourishing relationships. And what is at the heart and spirit of flourishing relationships. So I'm going to take some time to read this with you. You can read along. You can listen. Oh, yeah. Better is that better? There. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Who knew? <laughs> so thank you. So I'm going to read along. Um, you can read along with me. Just listen. So we'll take some time just to take in the intention of these interviews that we're about to participate in. And then I'll turn it back over to Prue, who will then give us some instructions on uh, how we'll participate in these interviews. So flourishing relationships. We are in a continuum of relationships throughout our day. From the moment we wake, our minds engage with thoughts and feelings that are directed both inward towards the self and outward towards others. The ebb and flow between each bridges our experiences and influences the experiences of those around us. Relationships that are anchored in compassion, hope, curiosity, and mindfulness. Compassion, hope, curiosity, and mindfulness. Open our hearts and our minds and elevate our individual and collective sense of possibility. This room is so full of possibility already. So the first focus of our um, interview is going to be on affirming working relationships. Tell me, or you'll be working with your partner, but you could tell me too. <laughs> tell me about a time that you have been in a positive, life-affirming working relationship in which your strengths were elevated and integrated into a work project or outcome. So we're turning inward and looking specifically at your strengths. How did this relationship get started? Think back over the course of the relationship. What stands out as significant and meaningful high points in this story? How did you gain each other's respect and trust? The second interview topic we're going to look at is about best collaborative experiences. This is a room full of collaborators, so you will have plenty of stories, I'm certain. What's been the most successful collaboration that you've been involved in what did you appreciate about the collaboration? In your story, describe some of the qualities and practices that made the collaboration successful. What did you value about your contribution to the collaboration? What and how did you contribute? How did you uncover and leverage the strengths and passions of your collaborators? What motivated you? How did you feel? What did you value about the other collaborators? What did they contribute? And how did the similarities and differences help the overall experiences? So I'm going to give you about four minutes to consider yourself in the green room preparing for your interview. So jot down a few notes. 
So you'll have to be ready when, you're, when we move to invent, into the interview. So about four minutes, kind of thinking yourself in the green room, preparing for your interview. So jot down some notes so you'll be able to speak to that when we go live. All righty then. So let's uh, talk for a minute about extraordinary interviewers. When somebody is an extraordinary interview, it could be somebody you heard on the radio or television, what do extraordinary interviewers do? They listen. What else? How do you? They ask good questions. Because I could, you know, you could think I'm listening. I've got a good nod going, a little eye contact. But I'm really working on my shopping list. You don't know that. How you know I'm really listening is those follow-on questions that go deeper, right, that engage that person. So ever, ever listen to Terry Gross on public radio? Oh, my gosh, she's so extraordinary, right? She's, you know, because this person's been on the circuit, right? But somehow at the end of the show, she goes, Jill, thanks for being on today. And Jill goes, no, thank you, Prue, because... She's discovered things in that process that she didn't even know were percolating there because of the questions and follow-up questions that I dug. So you're going to get a chance to be an extraordinary interviewer for 10 minutes and profoundly listen and ask questions of your partner. You're going to stay with that person through those questions during those 10 minutes. Why is it I wouldn't want you to go back and forth? I do one, you do one. What happens when that, when that goes on, if we bop back and forth? I'm working on my own answer. Boy, Jill's brilliant today. I better come up with something good. Right? Yeah, we are totally going to give that gift of profound listening with that other person for 10 minutes. And we'll tell you. We'll give you a two-minute warning. Done. And then we're going to switch. And you'll get to interview the other person. So at your table, I want you to pick a partner. Now, wouldn't it be good if there's somebody at the table you didn't know so well, besides the buddy you traveled with, that that's who you partner with? So you have five seconds to find your partner at the table. Some of you might have to cross tables if you have an extra person. Pick a partner. All right. Does everybody have a partner? If you somehow end up in a triple, you're going to have to manage your time more quickly. Oh, we got a roving person. You got somebody? Yeah. Okay. Get your best interviewer on. Are you ready? Channel that best interviewer. Ten minutes to get through both sets of questions. Ready? Go. All right. Now I want you to thank each other for profoundly listening to each other. Thank them for being on the show today with you. All right, let's do a little popcorn as you are so wired into each other. What did you learn about um, igniting your own positive core? What themes did you hear from each other about igniting your own positive core? Yes. Joy. joy. Oh, it taps into that joy. Keep the room lit up as you started te telling each other your stories. What else? What ignites that positive core? Taking a chance, taking that leap, which we got asked to do, you know, when we're trying something new and we're evolving a landscape, it means taking a chance. Yes. Being open to change. Being open to change, right? And if I'm focused on my strict, sometimes that person sees something in me that I don't see, right? I remember the first time I got asked to do a, to speak at a, con, a national conference and I was, I was, I worked at a plant, you know, I was an HR uh, employee relations rep. But I'd done this big project. She goes, no, you should go to the national conference and talk. I'm like, what? Right? But she, she saw that possibility in me that launched a whole, you know, 25-year career. Right? Somebody that sees the possibility, sees that strength, encourages you to get to the edge and make that leap of faith. What else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we have so many stories. Even if you partner with somebody who's known you for 20 years, they might not have heard that one before, I understood that about you, and what a gift that they know you at a deeper level. How about igniting other people's positive core? What else? What, what, how do we do that? Yeah? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, it's that humility thing. Ditch it. Right? Yeah, we've been trained. Like, oh, no, don't say what you're good at. Like, why the hell not? These are my strengths. These are my gifts. Share them so that people can leverage them. What am I passionate about? What are my values? If I keep those hidden, right? I need to understand those at a deep level. Understanding when I'm at my best at a deep level. So I can, when we appreciate something, what does that mean? If we buy a house and appreciate it, it gains value. So if I appreciate my strengths and others do, they gain value and grow. Absolutely. How about around best collaborations? If you vision the future around best collaborations, what seeds from your conversation are you going to bring to those? Best collaboration. What are the seeds of best collaborations? Yeah, being honest with the other person, which sometimes includes my strengths and passions, and sometimes what I'm worried about and where I'm going to need support. What else? Yep. Trust, right? Like the chips in the bank, earning trust, doing what we say we're going to do, right? Following through in our commitments. If we're going to miss it, we let the person know, right? Yep. Taking risks. Huge, huge, taking risks. Being willing to try on a new set of glasses. Right, what's the definition of insanity? Right, so sometimes I need to look at what in my mindset is getting in the way of me producing the results I say I want. And it might mean I have to let go of an old story and have a new one that creates new possibilities for myself, for my team, for my stakeholders. All right, was it fun? I wish I had like a energy meter, like the minute, whoa, yeah. All right. What are you? It's like so magical. Oh, you go ahead. I love it. Beep. Yeah. So we're just going to, I'm going to uncover a little bit because I want Miriam to tell the story of what does it really take to integrate appreciative inquiry into a DNA of, a, of an organization. So appreciative inquiry, it's a way of looking and being in the world. It's about seeking and looking and appreciating strengths. It's also about having that be my framework for positive change versus a deficit-based framework. It's a positive-based framework. All right, I'm going to say cancel, cancel, and you're going to have to race. But I'm, a seed I'm going to plant, and then you have to race it. Does everybody do that? So if we'd started this with, tell me about when you've been at your worst, and other people are at their worst, and when collaboration sucked. <laughs> Cancel! Okay. It, it limits your possibilities for what you can dream about in the future, right? And so as we lift up our strengths and best stories, it allows us to create a much bigger possibility of what the future could be. And then it's also, what's really critical, it's really a methodology for engaging multiple stakeholders, right? People don't mind change, they mind being changed by somebody else. If this is about change, let's include the whole system that's going to take to create that breakthrough. So the shift in appreciative inquiry is really moving from that, what most of us grew up in was a traditional problem solving methodology, right? I spent most of my career in and out of a lot of manufacturing organizations and you looked at the problem, you asked the five whys, you got to the root cause, right, because something's broken. And if we really study that, we'll be able to make progress. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yeah, we've had lots of training on it. Yet, what we've forgotten, if you do like the Gallup poll says, well, what, how about success? Well, that'll take care of itself. Eh, we're going to reframe that. We really want to study success when we've been at our best, when a student has had a breakthrough, when families were totally engaged in this process when it worked for the whole system, when schools were uplifted, when the organization was uplifted, how did that happen? What was the root cause of that? We need to study success so we can do what? Replicate it, accelerate it, do more of it, right? When we learn what not to do, it doesn't necessarily tell us what to do. So how do we balance the scale to study success? Yeah, so it's about appreciating what is, what gives life, then looking at, based on that, where do we want to be? What's our dream for the future? Then is it, well, if you have a dream and no plan, you got hope, right? It's really about taking that dream and then saying, how are we going to go about achieving that? And then implementing and continuing that loop. As we do our implementation and we have successes, how do we elevate those and understand those? 
and apply those to where we missed the mark so that we continue to grow. So that's my little blurb on appreciative inquiry, but what's so exciting, so when we got the request from the center to come and, and do this talk, I said, well, I'm bringing Miriam, who I'd only met maybe six months prior, because they're bringing it to life, these concepts to life in mosaic learning, so rock on, Miriam. <laughs> thank you, Bruce. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, actually before we get into appreciative, before we get into appreciative inquiry, what I'd like to do is start with how we got there. It was quite a journey. Um, we had been at uh, the Mosaic Learning Center. We provide um, services, both educational and therapeutic, in our independent schools, as well as in the public school um, through our consultation practice. Um, so we had been at this for about 11 years. We're a relatively new independent school and one of the few of its kind in the state. And um, we had been driven by the model of problem and solutions that Pru just uh, talked about. And um, so I laugh, my coworker, Michelle Irish, who is the clinical and educational director, she and I share a space together. And I kid you not, we felt like we were on a conveyor belt. Um, I love that, be careful when belt is in motion. And it was in motion. <laughs> and we were on, uh, we, we were kind of at our edge, the, the teams that were uh, working with students in schools were constantly being presented with problems, being asked to provide solutions, and we were doing the same in our own organization. Staff would come forward with problems and we would be asked to provide solutions. So one day, at the end of a long day, Michelle and I sat there. We were tired. We were very, very tired. And we just sat with the mess. Frank Barrett uh, does a lot of work in appreciative inquiry. And, and we sat with that mess for a while and we imagined and we thought, could this be different? What could this be like? How might we? And from that point, there was this little voice in the back of my head. I had a very de dear friend who had been working in appreciative inquiry for a very long time, and she kept talking to me about appreciative inquiry. And I was like, you know what, Michelle, let's make that call. And so we did. And so our journey began first with our clinical and educational team, who was maxed and who was really finding themselves ready for a change and building relationship. So we started to think about collaboration because the way we write our programs at Mosaic is a truly integrated program where the behaviorist and the, clini the clinicians, the special uh, educator, all sit down and they embed the different needs and, um, to create these really great programs. So we started to look at the heart of collaboration and what a really great collaboration could be. And um, so we did our first inquiry around that. So a short burst effort on our part. And uh, the team, it was phenomenal. Kind of what you saw here, you know, this depleted group, suddenly energy began to come into the room. And instead of tears, we were getting smiles. And instead of like, we can't, they were like, how might we, how can we? And that shift was so subtle, well actually not subtle, was so transformative that it actually created this ripple effect through our entire organization that really began to filter down to the hearts of our instructors. So from there, we're like, okay, let's do this with our whole staff. Let's bring in our whole staff and begin to have a conversation about the positive core of our organization. Well, at that point, we're hooked. Michelle and I are down to Longboat Key, going to uh, the certification program uh, with David Cooper Ryder. I'm like, let's go. Let's just take this to the next level. So we get back and um, Michelle and I began to imagine what it would be like to use appreciative inquiry as a way of programming, creating meaningful programs for our students. What would that look like? To take the story beyond the deficits, beyond the assessments, and wrap and change the paradigm and begin to let the point of entry into programming be about the positive strengths, the positive core of the student. What might that look like? So the student summit was brought to life. And um, we did our first student summit where we invite all the stakeholders into the room. So it would be the parents, any physician, mental health providers, um, the sending school, uh, community providers. And we begin to focus on the positive core of the student and sharing stories of success, what it might mean for what, what, when parents and our own instructors see the child at their best academically, socially, and you move beyond, at that point, all the numbers, all the diagnosis, and you begin to feel the heart and spirit 
of the family. People want their stories to be heard. They matter. They begin to broaden and build the landscape of possibility. What you see up here is a mosaic framework. It's what we kind of use now as a model for bringing um, parents and families together and how we actually even approach creating programs in our school. What you see is the Ford D cycle on the outside, the discovery, the dream, the design, and the delivery. And at the center of it, you see the positive core. But around that positive core is relationship. And that's what I think I've really come to appreciate about the AI process, is that it builds relationships by setting that intentional space for listening, for learning. We begin to build relationship and we begin to invite possibility into the room. We set aside being the knowers and we let people come in and we become collectively the co-creators. It is quite exceptional. We did a um, summit with one of our really a great kid. He had come to us. The, the family was, usually when they come to our school, we're very small. Um, they, uh, they're tired. The parents are tired, the school is tired, the child is not finding the typical success um, that they'd hoped for or wanted. Um, and so he had been in our school for a while and we went um, to do the summit back at their site. And we bring our instructors and we bring our special educators and our clinicians and we partner up. And we purposely partner with different people. We don't want to partner with our own teams. Um, so we get to know each other and learn about each other. So we're sitting in the room and they go off and they do these interviews just like you've done today. And they're off in different parts of the school and they come back into the classroom and the stories are coming up and you could just feel the spirit of the child in the room and just the joy and the smiles. And it was that, you know, his behaviors, his, that had brought him to where he was in our school were just insignificant, truthfully insignificant. And at that moment, this teacher from the sending school raised her hand, she goes, we want him back. <laughs> and we brought him back. It was that moment. We changed the story. And that's what appreciative inquiry does. It allows you to reframe the story. Sometimes people will say to us, well, then you're just ignoring the areas of needs. They're in special education for a reason. And I say, no, that's not actually what happens. We broaden that landscape with the positive core of the student, the positive core of the whole system that supports that student. And that allows us to more holistically hold the areas of needs and challenge for the students that we serve. And it requires a sense of mindfulness, compassion, hope, resilience, and really looking at everyone that's there at the table at that day, they're doing the best that they can in that moment. So it's a privilege um, to be here. I just want to make sure that I've shared everything with you. This is for you, for your own note. This is what we kind of identify our student summit as. That's be in the slides for you. But this is what I'd just like to say. Barbara Fredrickson is phenomenal. She works out of uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Anybody know Barbara Fredrickson's work? Get to know her. It's about positive psychology and the power of positivity. Positivity opens us. The first core truth about positive emotions is that it opens our hearts and our minds, making us more receptive and more creative. And isn't that what you all are here today to do? To be more receptive, to be more creative, to change this landscape, this evolving landscape that we're all walking down together and walking on together. I will tell the story about 15 years ago, my wife and I built this, our home in Vermont in the middle of the woods. And we moved in and I looked out and I was like, oh my, that's quite a barren landscape we've got to deal with. <laughs> and uh, thank goodness the snow fell and uh, spring came and I was like, oh, that's quite a mud pit we've got to deal with. <laughs> but fortunately, my mother-in-law, who lived down at the bottom of the hill, was a, a marvelous gardener and she lived next door to a master gardener. For two years, they took me under their wing and took me to this fabulous symposium in southern Vermont to go and walk on these beautiful gardener, uh, garden that these gentlemen had created. And it was set up on a hill. And what always amazed me is you would enter at the bottom and before you knew it, you had journeyed all the way up to the top and didn't even know that you were on this journey because it was surrounded by so much beauty. So for two years, I went to this symposium with Anne and Pat, 
and I come back and I'd be like, no way, completely intimidated. Like, I cannot do a garden like that. <laughs> so the best I could muster was every fall, I would get the daffodil bulbs and I'd throw them in the ground, like, all right, <laughs> we've done it. And so the third year, the third year, I guess, being the charm, we went back and it was just another exceptional symposium full of beauty and imagination. And I swear they were talking to me, though. I know they weren't. But so uh, Joe Eck and Wayne Winterald were standing on the, at the podium. They were getting ready to close the symposium. And they said, it doesn't matter where you start so long as you start. And that's what I would say to you here today. It doesn't matter where you start to bring in that appreciative stance so long as you start. You have a tremendous landscape to work on and be in this week. You've already begun to build relationships just in this very brief moment. You've had conversations with people you might not have even known. Foster those. Let those be the nourishment for the ground that's before us and the opportunity, opportunities that we can cultivate. So what I'd like to do before we close out and open up to questions is share a video that we made for you guys about the mosaic and the story because um, these are the people who make it happen. So give me a moment to transition over to this. The Mosaic Learning Center is a, an organization that works with kids with developmental disabilities, ranging in age from 5 to 22. All of our students come to us with an IEP or an individual education plan, and then we develop goals that are part of that plan. And one of the things that we've really tried to do is think about what are the most important goals for the student and those are what go into the IEP. It's a little counterintuitive. We've been driven you know, by our profession to really focus on what the problem is, fix the problem, find the solution. So what we have found is that by using appreciative inquiry in the summit process we're really looking at the strengths of the student and then building on those strengths. There are lots of tangible results but more than that I think it just send, sets a tone for everybody's attitude moving forward instead of talking about all the challenges or everything that the student is missing, um, we start with, this is what the student's really good at and this is what the student really likes, or this is what we've really noticed the student um, feels passionate about. And then we can say, okay, from there, we know that the student needs to work on X, Y, and Z. So now let's, let's build on that strength and start working on X, Y, and Z. The summit is a celebration of a student. Um, we gather uh, members from the family, student input, staff input. I found it particularly valuable to hear the parents' insight into their hopes and dreams for their, for their child. I don't think they get opportunities to have those kind of conversations with professionals, so that was really nice. Gave me an idea of their background, like where they came from. Really helps me focus on what, what my next step is gonna be as a teacher. And it just is a, pers um, a perspective shift for people to think about, okay, we're not, instead of starting at zero and trying to build up, we're starting with a lot. Um, and it just sets the tone for a more positive interaction, I think, for everybody on the team. By using the Appreciative Inquiry Summit strategies, we've seen a huge shift in the relationships and the ability for parents and school folks and, and ourselves to be able to communicate better. Um, it's incredibly, it's been very powerful. It's also changed the way we look at kids by kind of focusing on their strengths and their areas of excellence. It shifts how we look at them on a day-to-day -day basis so those behaviors become less about, you know, their moments in time, they're not what the kid is all about. So they don't define the student, but they really help us just see the parts of them that, you know, need our support. I just think it's great for each student to be able to see what their strengths are and to pull together some awesome goals from those strengths. This process changes people's mindset to focus the team forward. AI has given us a platform or sort of a roadmap, if you will, to be able to think really clearly and mindfully about looking at those strengths. The goals are meaningful and the program is meaningful and kids make progress. Smiling faces. I love Michelle's comment that a behavior becomes a blip on the screen and not the defining who that, who that child is. And that 
there's a whole different lens that they're looking for, for those strengths to show up day in and day out and to appreciate and grow those. Yeah. So, um, so I think hopefully what you've already experienced in your own, this morning already is that strengths connect us as we have those conversations and identify strengths in ourselves, in our colleagues, in our organizations, in our work, that that begins to connect us and engages us in what's possible. Um, they uplift emotions. What I really love is they heighten the possibilities. When you beat a system up and ask it to vision, it can't vision very far. If you lift up the strengths and possibilities and when a system's at its best, when they go to dream, their dream is extraordinary because you're building on those strengths and, and what's, what they're passionate about. So any questions? Are we we're right around our time? Phil, how are we doing? Look at that. Yes, Jill. Oh, yeah, so I know, right? I need to blow that up. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so SOAR uh, was actually um, uh, designed by a woman. Her name was Jacqueline Stavros. It was an alternative to the SWOT analysis, the strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Thank you. And I love this. So what she did is she did strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results, right? And aspirations are such a beautiful word. So we take the IEP goals that, are, that we work on together and we wrap them in the aspirations that emerge in our summits. And it brings them light. There was a parent who shared this. She's like, you know, this process personalized the IEP. And that's what stories do. We're talking about stakeholders. So this was the whole summit and appreciate maker was really critical to, to the growth of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. And so it was having customers in the room at our summits and frontline employees and delivery, and, you know, people that did the delivery in the trucks. And so as, uh, you know, as Miriam and I were talking, it's like, well, if you look at the whole stakeholder group, well, how about the bus driver? That's the first person that picks that child up and the last point of contact. So I was dropping my, my uh, grandson off at school and there was a bus deli you know, delivering a a special educational child, and the teacher was standing outside, just like, come on, we got the day to start. And that kid just, it was just like this up, because that's the first. So when you think about multiple stakeholders, sometimes we have to stretch, like who are those stakeholders that are impacting the possibility for this child, and how can we lift them up and have them know how important their role is in this process of, of, of being with this child? Other questions? Oh, gosh. Okay, so um, I, I can use that. I'll just keep that. So um, ICT stands for Intentional Change Theory. Um, it's a work done by Dr. Richard Boyatzis out of Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. It's part of um, his theory that supports resonant leadership and how we can maintain resonance um, in the work as leaders and resonance in our own profession. So Intentional Change Theory, if you go to the inner the second uh, core inside, so there is the beginning with the ideal. You start by envisioning the ideal, which is what appreciative inquiry does. That comes out both in the uh, discovery and dreaming process. And then you um, are able to then go and hold the real. And that real really comes to life is through the assessments we do, whether it's FBA or any other kind of academic assessment we're working on with the child or other clinical assessments that we might be doing. Um, and then we're able to kind of do, um, kind of lay the two next to each other, put the two next to each other, and look where there's an alignment of strengths. And using that alignment of strengths and the ideal and the real, then begin to able to support the areas of need that our students with developmental disabilities have. So then you're the ideal, the, um, I just, the, oh, the learning, oh yeah, right, well, learning, it's all about the learning agenda. Um, and it's all about learning. So you create a learning agenda. So um, that parallels really nicely with the IEP process and the goal setting and, and kind of, we see it as, um, it's part of the goals, but it's, you know, that we're all on this journey of learning. So it helps support that. And then of course, practice. It's not about perfection from the get-go, it's about practice time and time again. And intentional change theory says that we're in a continuum in that process. We're constantly in the, par, you know, in the process, intentionally going into 
dreaming and discovering and, and building and envisioning for our students. So intention is really important in the work we do. We talk a lot about the difference between being well-intentioned and intentional. So we really try to practice mindfulness as we go into conversations with parents or sending schools and really looking at the power of intention and what that can create for outcomes. Thank you for asking that. Oh, gosh. I, that is, you're so sweet. Well, it's covered in snow. Um, <laughs> we just got our first snow as, as we left. Um, it is really quite something. You know, I um, was in my garden. I had a vegetable garden and perennial garden, and um, I was actually out weeding and cutting, and it's quite spectacular if I do say so myself. <laughs> Sometimes I think I might have put the shovel in the ground a little too often, <laughs> but it looks great. Thank you for asking. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, sorry, Phil. So there is a, and I, I'm not sure what you get. There's a, there is the, the Center for Appreciative Inquiry at Champlain College, and so um, we'll make sure that information gets out as a way to yeah, appreciate inquiry certificate programs and introductory programs that are going to be online. Um, and so David Cooperrider has not only given his name to the center, but he's given his thought leadership to the center. And so he's part of us uh, designing and really building this. It's really a global movement. What I love about it, it's, you know, yeah, little Vermont is the center. But uh, the next global conference is in Brazil in 2017. And so the work that people are doing across the globe, uh, really building a strength-based uh, focus and kind of mindset is really uh, powerful. So you can make sure we get that information out to you. But there's also some great books if you just Google Appreciative Inquiry. The Encyclopedia of Positive Questions, it's one of my Bibles. Like you don't need to invent stuff, go take it and then <laughs> modify, right? And so that's a wonderful resource. And, and we are doing a workshop later in the week uh, <laughs> if you want to learn more. And I think all, that presentation will be on the website too. So that will also has some more kind of detail of kind of the how to uh, do the work. The Encyclopedia of Positive Questions, the second edition. It's David Cooper writer and Diana Whitney, I Diana think. Diana Whitney, yeah. yep. That's one of my faves. That has a lot of post-it notes and underlining. That's what means a good sign. Mm -hmm. We love being, being on, on this journey, journey with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also really do want to say, I think you jointly say how much we appreciate the invitation to be here, Phil, uh, Marshall, for your vision to create this amazing uh, conversation that is still alive in Tina for your support and um, of this at, at the level that you are doing it. It is just clearly transformative. So thank you. <laughs>